Welcome back, everybody, to um, the conference. This is our third annual conference, as you know, at the MIT um, Golub Center for Finance and Policy. Um, we're very excited to have a, a full day of an interesting and fun set of programs. Um, this first session of the morning is called Ground Zero, um, Housing in the Mortgage Market. Um, I will not introduce the speakers by, with their bios and the like, because they are in the packages you've been handed, so you can, you can follow up and see who they all are and all of their great accomplishments. Um, we're going to go this morning just in the order that's in the program. Um, and uh, Antoinette, are you, are you presenting? Okay, so the first speaker is Antoinette Schwar of MIT Sloan and uh, doing work with the Center at Times um, on loan originations, defaults in the mortgage crisis, the role of the middle class. We, each um, speaker will have 15 minutes, the discussant will have 15 minutes, and then we're going to have a time to ask them questions and for general discussion following that. Cool. Are you going to tell me when I have five minutes left? Great. Good morning. Um, I'm delighted to be with, uh, with all of you here. Um, to get us um, started off, I, what I wanted to do is just to show you actually some very simple facts um, about the, the 2007-8 financial crisis, the mortgage crisis, um, that in our opinion, so that's joint work with my um, former students Manuela Delino and Felipe Severino, um, that we think actually casts a lot of the discussion of the mortgage crisis in a, in a quite different way. Like if you remember, right, the narrative of the financial crisis that has emerged from um, a lot of the policy debate, the, the media conversations, and all the, also some of the academic discussion has very much focused on the role of um, uh, the expansion if you, uh, of unsustainable credit, in particular to poor and low FICO borrowers, right? That, that's in a way um, where this idea that this was a subprime crisis came from, um, that there was an um, expansion of credit to marginal borrowers, to low income and low FICO borrowers, that then led to the downfall fall of the housing market. In fact, there are a lot of people who you know, have proposed this idea um, that there was a decoupling almost of income growth and credit growth, with it, which is typically unheard of, right? Because typically, um, you know, when we think of DTI, debt to income ratios, um, we think that banks obviously look at, um, you know, sustainable debt to income ratios. And, um, and a lot of the narrative of the financial crisis has been that this origination process was broken and therefore a lot of marginal and unsustainable borrowers um, got access to funding. Now what I want to show you is that in our opinions, opinion, the facts don't line up with this narrative. In fact, what I want to show you is that credit expanded very differently. And I will even go so far and say that calling this 2008 crisis a subprime crisis is a misnomer. Um, in fact, it was a prime crisis. And why do I say this? I will show you this, these results, but just to give you, um, you know, a, a preview of what I will show you is, the first thing that I'll show you is that credit expanded proportionately across the income distribution and across the FICO distribution. It is not the case that there was um, this proportionate increase in credit to the subprime or the low income groups. Everybody participated in this mortgage expansion, but in particular the middle class and the upper middle class, and if you take a step back, that actually makes a lot of sense because those are the income groups that take bigger, how, I mean buy bigger houses, therefore take bigger mortgage credit, and therefore on a dollar weighted basis, they were much more important in the overall expansion. The second fact, and, and let me also say, what I'll also show you is that debt to income ratios as a, as a stock and a flow actually proportionately, in, again, increased across the income distribution. There was not somehow um, you know, a, a dislocation to the subprime or the low income. The second thing I want to show you is that even the way defaults happened post-2007, so in the onset of the crisis, is very much in line with this idea that this, the subprime market wasn't the main driver. Because what I will show you is that the biggest increase in defaults happened in the prime segments, not the subprime segments, and they contributed much more to the overall dollar in, dollars in default. So 
it was actually the prime and the middle class household that, default, that contributed much more to the defaults. And so if we put this, you know, these main facts together, what we want to, or, you know, how do we explain this, right? What do we want to point to is that really that it's very important to understand the role of, of asset prices and the run up in the asset prices, um, so house prices, in, um, in the mortgage uh, expansion and then in the defaults afterwards. In fact, what we believe is that a lot of what we saw in the 2007-8 crisis, these facts point to um, the fact that there was an increase in asset prices that led borrowers and lenders to buy into those increased asset values and lend against and also borrow against these. And once the economy slowed down, uh, it led to defaults, not necessarily only at the, at the you know, flau FICO and, and low income people, but even you know, in the middle class or particular in the middle class. And the other thing that actually supports this view that house price expectation and the increase in house price values as collateral were very important in explaining um, this expansion is what I will also show you is that a lot of the run up in the debt of the debt was driven by household decisions about relevering, so taking out home equity, and also increasing the churn of, of borrowing, uh, sorry, of, of mortgage purchases and therefore borrowing. Um, why is that important? Because if you think about quicker churn of buying and selling houses leads endogenously to a setup or a resetting up of um, leverage um, each time somebody buys a house. So let me show you what this looks in the data, um, and then hopefully we can have a, uh, a debate. Um, so the data, very simple, right? We have different pieces of very standard um, data about the US mortgage market. So um, HAMDA, Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, gives us all the flows of new credit into the housing market. So HAMDA collects um, literally every residential mortgage that is being originated in the US. We know the balance of the mortgage. We know the type, whether it's you know, purchase and refi, but also whether it's a 30-year fixed or an arm, whether it's initiated by a subprime lender or not. right? Um, and we also know the borrower income at, uh, at application. This is the, re the self re or the bank reported borrower income. We then also use IRS income to look at you know, people's income le level from an IRS perspective. We have house prices um, and house turnover or house churning from Zillow. Um, and then what's very important is going forward, um, we have um, data on mortgage performance from LPS, um, which gives you information about which mortgages defaulted, which ones you know, went late, etc. And um, we have actually several different sources. So we have Loan Price Service Corporation data, but then also information from Freddie Mac, from Black Box Logic, which, which gives us a lot of information of loan performance um, in different segments of the US um, housing market. So you know, agency loans, non-agency loans, et cetera. And then finally, you know, we also have information on the stock of household debt from the Federal Reserve Board Survey. All right, so let me show you in a few numbers what I just, or in a few graphs, what I just told you. So the first thing I want to convince you of is that if you look at the run-up of debt in the pre-crisis, what you see is actually quite, at least the first time we looked at it, we were stunned. So because what you see is, in a way, you see nothing. So what is this? What, yeah, I mean, you'll see in a second what I mean with this. So this, what we did here is we used from Hamda the, the, all the low residential mortgages originated in the US on a cohort by cohort basis or year by year basis. So here we would take all the mortgage dollars originated in 2002. We would sort them into income bins, so intile quantiles, so the lowest 20%, the next 20% by income, and the highest 20% by income. And what you see is what you completely would have expected, right? The lowest 20% of homeowners by income have the smallest fraction of new uh, dollars of new mortgages originated to them, only 11%. Right? while the richest 20% make up 34% of the dollars originated. They are the richer people, they buy the bigger houses, um, you know, that, that is not surprising at all. 
But interestingly, if we move forward in time, so even say in 2006, in the height of the, of the housing bubble, we see that this distribution did not change, right? So even in, at the height of the bubble, the percentage of loans, mortgage dollars, going to the low income people um, is still around 11%. And the percentage to the highest income buckets, right, is 36 and 20 and very stable. Of course, right, this is percentages. The number of mortgage dollars originated went up. But what we are arguing is that when it, while it was going up, everybody, per, um, all income groups proportionately contributed or participated in this run up, right? So there's not a dislocation to the poor or the marginal um, people here. Now I can show you the same thing, let's skip ahead, by FICO, right? You might have said, well, maybe by income, um, something happened about how the FICO scores of these poorer or richer people changed. But actually, you see the same thing here, right? So this is same logic. I take year by year the entire mortgage dollars originated in the US. I sort them by this, typically what we call the subprime, below 660, 660 the near prime between 660 FICO and 720, and then the prime um, borrowers. And again, you see what you would have expected in 2002, right? Uh, subprime borrowers made the smallest made up the smallest fraction of total dollars originated in the mortgage market, and of course, prime made up the biggest. Now fast forward, right, to 2006. Again, we see no change, no dislocation where dollars proportionately were flowing. So this is my first point, that the way credit expanded was proportionately for everybody. And in particular, of course, in absolute values, the dollars here, right, were much bigger than the, the, the dollars here because, you know, these people, t the poorer people and low FICO people take smaller mortgages. All right, that's the first fact. Um, just quickly, you might say, oh, but what about, say, all the other mortgage-related pro pro products, HELOCs, um, cash out refi, second lien, did they disproportionately go to low income and low FICO people? This graph shows you no, that's not the case either. Even here, right, things are proportionate, proportionate with people's income, also with people's FICO. All right, now, of course, right, we are not saying there was no run up in debt, right, in the stock of debt. What I showed you is that origination proportionately increased for everybody, but there was an increase also in the stock of debt. And the, the things I want to point to is that what we see is, number one, there was a dramatic increase in the speed or the churn in which people bought and sold their houses. So this um, graph shows you the fraction of, mortgage, of houses that um, were bought within the last year, within the last 12 months, over you know, the 1998 to 2014 time period. And you see exactly this massive run-up of people that were quickly, or much quicker, buying and selling debt, uh, mortgages. Sorry, selling houses and therefore taking mortgages, right? So this is telling you that there was a run-up in the stock of debt because people were buying and selling their houses much more quickly. Which means, right, there was a demand side effect, if you want, um, or people buying into the increasing house prices. Let me skip, a, skip these things and show you in the little time I've left. Um, the second big fact that I wanted to show you, which is now post-2007, where did um, the, the defaults actually happen, right? What, who contributed to the crisis? And here you see actually a, a stunning change. It's the exact same logic, right, that this graph has um, that I showed you before. We now, again, what we do is we take mortgages originated, say, in 2003. We now follow them for three years out, and we see within each of these income bins, what is the fraction of loans dollar-weighted that are in default. Why did we take three years? It's because typically people um, who default take about three years to default. We tried other cutoff, it really doesn't make a difference. But you see in 2003, you see exactly what you would have expected to, uh, to see. The low income households or mortgage holders contribute 
disproportionately to dollars in default, right? The 20% lowest income um, house owners make up 22% of the dollars in default, while you know, the richest 20% make up only 13%. But remember, they had 34% of the dollars originated, right? So um, you know, this is exactly what we would have expected, right? Richer people um, you know, typically are higher credit a better credit risk, and so they are defaulting um, less, less. Um, but look what happened through the, the onset of the crisis. So if you go to the last year here, so this is 2006, following people into 2009. And what you see is that the fraction um, of the bins that contribute now to defaults completely change. It's the highest 20% and then the next 20%, right, that make up about 50% of dollars in default, while actually the contribution of the low-income households are now very small. Of course, defaults went up, right? But what we are saying is that what was unprecedented is the amount of defaults that happened in the high-income groups. Um, why is this? And, you know, and also, why did lots of people get this wrong? Is because there's a confusion between levels and rates because so say the the low lowest income group on average even in the best of time has about six percent likelihood to default and in the crisis it went to about 12 percent that's of course a very high number and a high rate but for the high income groups it went from almost zero percent in normal time to five to six percent post-crisis and because here is where all the dollars, mortgage dollars are. This is why those groups um, you know, really contributed massively to, to the defaults. I can do the same thing for FICO. And look, same story, right? In normal quote unquote times, pre-crisis times, it's the subprime loans that default the most. In the post-crisis time, so remember following out to 2009, it's the prime and near prime households that contributed the most. Given that I'm almost out of time, let me show you a final thing, which is if we look where did these high FICO and high income people default, what we see is that it's in the areas where house prices first went up and then went down. So it's really, it looks very much that households whose mortgage was underwater, so to speak, their housing option was out of the money, were the ones that defaulted the most. So to skip ahead, right, finally, what do I want to say here to sum up? What we think that these results show is that there was an asset boom, or you can say an asset bubble um, uh, happening in the pre-2008 crisis. And homeowners and home and, uh, and lenders were both contributing or buying into this you know, mortgage crisis. And then when house prices went down, a lot of people defaulted on that option, the house or the mortgage that they were holding, that was now underwater. Why is that really important? Because it's a different narrative of the crisis than a, mis a crisis of bad incentive or as or at origination. It's because the policy recommendations are very different, right? For this, better screening at origination doesn't do the trick. We need macro prudential tools to actually uh, protect ourselves against these type of dynamics in the housing market. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our <laughs> our next speaker is Daniel Greenwald from MIT talking about the mortgage credit channel of macroeconomic transmission. Thank you, Dan. How do I get the... Oh, perfect. Keep on speaking too, because I have a bunch of them. Oh. <laughs> okay. I have this too. Okay, so thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here talking to you. And um, today I'll be talking from a kind of macroeconomic perspective about mortgage markets. So. You know, we all know that mortgage markets are important. That's kind of why we're all in this room. And thanks to work by Antoinette and others, we have a lot of great empirical work these days telling us kind of that these things really do matter in the data. Um, but I think despite this progress, there's still a lot we have to learn about the core mechanisms connecting credit, house prices, and economic activity, especially at the macro level. So the main question I'm going to ask in this paper is if and how credit um, issuance, the issuance of new loans, 
can serve as an amplification mechanism, changing the way the macroeconomy responds to shocks like productivity or interest rates, or even to the credit standards themselves, which I'll call the mortgage credit channel of transmission. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set up a general equilibrium macro framework, and I'm just going to put in two important but largely unstudied, at least in macro, features of US mortgage markets. The first one is that the size of new loans is going to be limited by a payment to income constraint that caps the ratio of mortgage payments to borrower income. I'm going to impose this alongside a loan to value constraint that's standard in the uh, macro modeling literature. And it turns out that interactions will actually be key here. Second, borrowers in the model will hold long-term fixed rate loans and can choose to prepay uh, at a cost to replace their existing loans and replace them uh, with new ones. So what does this buy me? Well, I find that when you take these features and calibrate them to match what you see in the mortgage microdata, they generate very strong transmission from movements in interest rates into debt, house prices, and economic activity. The initial source of the transmission is that the payment to income limits themselves are highly sensitive to nominal interest rates, so that if this is your binding constraint, it can change by roughly 10% in response to a 1% movement in mortgage rates. But it turns out this actually by itself wouldn't be enough to generate big effects. The key turns out to be a, a novel propagation mechanism through which changes among borrowers and which of the two constraints is binding translates into large movements in house prices, which I'll call the constraint switching effect. And quantitatively, it can be large, where price rent ratios can rise by up to 4% following a persistent 1% fall in rates due to this channel kind of by itself almost. Uh, my second main set of findings relates to credit standards and the source of the boom bust, where I'm going to find that a payment to income liberalization, a loosening of these allowed payment to income ratios, appears really important to understanding what, what happened. So that has kind of two parts to it. The first one is that I find that changes in loan to value or down payment standards by themselves have a tough time explaining the boom for reasons I'll show you. In contrast, this payment income liberalization works both qualitatively, it has features that, that look like what happened, but also quantitatively, which is that when I match it to how much I actually observe these ratios being relaxed, you can generate somewhere between a third and half of the boom in price rent ratios and in debt to household income ratios. So it's not the whole story, but I think it's an important piece. So before I get into all the details, let me just show you some intuition, an example, about how this works. And if you can follow this, I promise you know the whole paper. So let's think about a home buyer who, you know, like many home buyers, wants basically as large a house as possible and doesn't want to pay more than the minimum in down payment. Let's assume that this borrower faces a payment to income limit of 28%, so she can put 28% of her income toward the mortgage, and a loan to value limit of 80%, so she has to put 20% down. Okay? So we need a couple more numbers here. Let's give her an income of $50,000 a year which means that a 28% payment income, her maximum monthly payment is about $1,200, okay? Now we need one more thing, which is the interest rate. So at a, let's say it's a 6% interest rate, so that a $1,200 monthly payment is associated with a loan size of $160,000, okay? Now she has to put 20% down, so that $160,000 loan is actually associated with a house uh, that costs $200,000, which I've drawn in red here. So what's special about this house price? Well, it introduces this kink in the down payment function. If the borrower chooses a house that costs less than $200,000, she's actually down payment, she's actually loan to value constrained. How much she can borrow is capped by the value of her collateral. As she increases the house size in this range, she actually only has to put down 20 cents on the dollar because she can borrow the other 80 cents. But beyond this point, the borrower actually has to put down dollar for dollar in cash. The bank won't lend her any more money no matter how valuable the collateral is because she's hit her income limit. So if you're a borrower who doesn't want to pay too much in down payment, or like many home buyers, you're saving for the down payment, uh, you get a lot more bang for your buck on this side than this side, which means that many borrowers may actually choose to go right to this kink point. Let's imagine that, that this borrower does. And now let's imagine that interest rates fall, OK? So I'm going to have interest rates fall from 6% to 5%. Now, um, when the interest rate falls, the borrower's maximum payment is still $1,200 a month. But at a lower rate, that's associated now with a much larger loan. In fact, a loan that's 11% larger. So it goes up from 160 to 178,000. If we put the down payment back in, this uh, house price at which the kink occurs also increases by 11%. And if the borrower again follows her corner solution, um, she's actually going to increase the size of the value of the house that she looks for. Which, and this force could potentially push housing demand up. Essentially, what the banks told this borrower is that she can get more credit, but only if she gets a larger house to back the loan. And that's going to send people looking for bigger, more valuable houses. So what about my arguments about credit standards? 
Well, okay, if we relax the maximum payment to income ratio, it's exactly the same thing. You've just told the borrower that given her income, she can get a bigger loan. You move this kink point out to the right the same, the same way. The results are identical. But it turns out that actually relaxing the loan to value limit has very different effects. So here, I'm gonna add in one extra line, which is the maximum loan the borrower can get under her payment to income, which is 160,000. That's not gonna change. But now, as I relax the LTV constraint from 80 to 90, meaning I relax the, the minimum down payment from 20 to 10, the house price associated with this loan, when we add in the down payment, actually falls. And if the borrower follows her corner solution, she's actually gonna demand a less valuable house, pushing housing demand down. So what's going on here? This is kind of weird, because you loosen credit conditions. Normally we think housing demand would rise. Well, before you did this, actually, if the borrower did this move from 200,000 to about 180, she would only have kept a couple thousand dollars in cash, because the size of her allowable loan would have fallen by a lot. But now, actually, she gets to keep the entire difference, making it much more tempting. Another way you can think about these results is in terms of demand and supply for collateral. So in some sense, the borrower is getting the same loan anyway. She's getting $160,000. That's the amount she has to collateralize. So the demand for collateral is kind of fixed here. But now, when you loosen the down payment standard, each unit of housing can collateralize more debt. So the supply of collateral has gone up. So demand fixed, supply up. That means the price of collateral falls, pushing down house prices. OK? So um, great. So let me just show you what these things look like in the data. So the LTV constraint, like I said, it's a down payment constraint. The key property you need to know about it is that it moves with house prices. So that when house prices rise, you can borrow more. And if you look in this data, this is Fannie Mae single uh, family loan level origination data. This is a, a plot, a histogram of loan to value ratios. The effect of the constraint is obvious, right? The, almost the entire mass of new borrowers are in some huge spike at some institutional limit. Like this is where private mortgage insurance kicks in. These are other institutional limits. So we clearly see borrowers bunching. Now what about payment to income? I've plotted this on the right. By the way, this is from 2014, so it's a recent vintage. Um, in this case, the key property to know about this, by the way, is as we saw in the picture, it moves quite a bit with interest rates. And the data is actually has this funny wedge shape where it's rising, 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 then it falls off a cliff kind of at this institutional limit. What I think is going on here is that borrowers actually are targeting, not all of them, but some of them, are targeting this limit. But actually, there's only one exact dollar amount that will get you there. And if there's search frictions in housing, you may not be able to find a house that exactly nails that exact corner or kink point. So to, and if you end up a little bit below, actually, you'll generate exactly this picture. Now, some evidence for this, I'm working on trying to measure exactly how many people are constrained. But if you don't have a search friction, if you take that away, like, for example, with cash out refis, where borrowers stay in their house, you should see more bunching. And in fact, you do. So this is the same picture with cash out refis. You see a lot more bunching right up against the constraint, even though there's good reasons to think these borrowers would be less income constrained. And um, so my conclusion from this is that some, but not all, borrowers do seem to be influenced by this constraint. OK? So now, you know, as I told you, moving away from the simple example, I put everything in a big model. Um, and here, the equivalent of that kind of kink point is that now what's going to matter is the fraction of loan-to-value constrained borrowers in the population, which will move endogenously with economic conditions. And the idea is that the loan-to-value constrained borrowers are willing to pay more for housing. They demand more because it, it does an extra service for them. It uses the collateral. They're willing to pay a premium. So when FLTV, the fraction constrained by loan-to-value, is high, house prices will also be high. Now you can see what's going to happen in the big model. When rates fall, the payment income limits will loosen. And so many borrowers who are formerly constrained by payment income will now find loan-to-value to be their, their binding constraint, which is going to push up the fraction constrained by loan-to-value and uh, push up house prices. Now this next part is key, um, because when house prices rise, you're also going to loosen loan to value limits. So if you trace this, this sort of flow chart through, this last step is really critical. Why is it critical? Well, as Antoinette just told you, most of what we saw during the boom, most borrowing is actually not determined by people who are income constrained. It's determined mostly by people who are loan to value constrained, the effective house prices. But that's exactly what happens here. So this action at the margin, due to the payments income constraint and the interaction, is going to push up house prices enough that actually most of the action will come through this channel, where people who have never even been affected by the payments income constraint will be able to borrow more because their houses are worth more. OK, so actually it fits pretty well with that, that story. So let's see this in action. I'm going to show you three different economies just to be super clear about, about what's causing what. 
where I'm going to have a, a, in blue a, an, an economy, like an uh, example economy, where we only had a loan to value constraint. That's the only game in town. This orange one, that's going to be a payment to income economy, where we only have payment to income constraints. And in red, I'll have my benchmark economy, which I think is the real world where you have both. Okay? And what I'm going to do is just show you in the macro full model setting what happens when you cut interest rates by 1%, nominal rates. So you can see here this yellow line is the payment income economy. It rises by much more than the blue line, which is the LTV economy. And that's not surprising because, like I told you, these payment income constraints are really, uh, really sensitive to rates. But what's interesting is that even though in the model, as in the data, only about a quarter of borrowers, so a small uh, minority of borrowers are constrained by payment income, the red benchmark line is actually closer to the payments income only economy than the loan to value only economy. So that's where this constraint switching stuff really gets important because what's happened here is that the fraction constrained by loan to value rises by a lot as you loosen this constraint. And that means that in the benchmark economy, you see a much bigger increase in house prices and price rent ratios, which is then spilling over into debt. So that's where these effects really start to matter. Okay, so last, let me just show you um, my second set of results about what happened in the boom bust. So um, here's the exactly, I'm just gonna argue very briefly that these things look massively loosened during the boom. So on the right hand side, we have the same payments income picture I showed you from 2014, where you clearly see people kind of ramping up toward this constraint. Left hand side is the same picture in 2006. If I took this red line away, you would never know there was any regulatory limit at all. Um, and by the way, this is the good stuff. This is Fannie Mae conventional, conventional mortgages, right? This is not some weird subprime low doc thing, which I think would have made things even worse, okay? And the same thing, when I showed you more bunching for cash outs, you again see nothing in 2006, okay? So what am I gonna do here? I'm basically gonna do an experiment where I do one of two things, so separate experiments. I'm either gonna relax the maximum payment to income ratio, uh, leave it that way for eight years and then retighten it, That'll be my boom bust. Or I'll try the same thing with a loan to value liberalization, where I loosen the loan to value ratio and then retighten it eight years later. So this is what I get. I find that this loan to value liberalization doesn't do that well. It's the green line, okay? And you can see here that there's kind of two things going on. Because I've kept payments income liberalization, uh, payments income constraints you know, intact, as borrowers, uh, house prices are rising but incomes are flat, you kind of can't have debt rise that much because borrowers start smacking into these limits, okay? But moreover, there's this general equilibrium effect on prices, where as the fraction of borrowers constrained by loan to value is falling because borrowers are hitting these payment to income limits, it's actually putting a lot of downward pressure on collateral demand and on price rent ratios. So in this example, price rent ratios actually fall, whereas during the boom, they were exploding. So this is really not a good fit by itself for what happened. Instead, you know, the blue line represents a payment to income liberalization, which is a much better fit because you know, as you're loosening payment to income uh, constraints, everybody starts becoming loan to value constrained. That's the blue line. This is the fraction constrained by loan to value. That's pushing up the demand for collateral, um, pushing up house prices and price rent ratios by quite a bit, just like we saw during the real boom. And actually, uh, that gives you a big increase in debt not just from those who are income constrained, but also by those who are loan to value constrained and see their house prices rise. So, um, you know, who cares? Uh, aside from historical interest, I think for macro prudential policy, this is potentially important because it implies that a cap on payment to income ratios, not loan to value ratios, is potentially the more effective policy for limiting boom and bust cycles because you can cap loan to value and still leave yourself completely exposed to this blue path. So, um, that's the whole paper. Uh, I argue that incorporating these two um, important features into macroeconomics, a payment income constraint, and the endogenous prepayment of long-term debt, which I didn't talk about here, but you can see in the paper, generates very strong transmission from interest rates into debt, house prices, and economic activity, and also shows that payment to income liberalization could have been a, an important part of the boom bust. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Our next speaker is uh, Pedro Gate um, with his um, paper with Michael Reher from Harvard um, on systemic banks, mortgage supply, and housing rents. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, organizers, for inviting us to present. Michael is here also with, uh, with me. So this is a paper about housing rents. The reason we focus on housing rents is because they have increased very fast in the last five years. There is ample heterogeneity among, across MSAs, but if you see, for example, here the top 
10% MSAs by average growth in, in rents in the top 20, you can see that basically in the last five years, they increased much more than the last 30 years. These are real rents. Why this is important, especially for policymakers, is because if you look the ratio of rent to income, you see that the increase is an order of magnitude that when you go to historical evidence, you see that basically in five years, increase much more than, I would say, in more than 30, 40 years. So this creates problems of affordability for many households, and policymakers are concerned about this. This is a period at the same time when we saw a big drop in home ownership. Basically, these are, are uh, low, record, low record levels. And then in this paper, what we try to study is, can we try to uh, analyze in a causal way uh, drivers of these three fats? And we are going to claim that a potential explanation, and we are going to try to provide uh, support for this, is tight credit. So to summarize the results, this is a paper in which we do a series of econometric tests uh, to try to identify causality from credit. And what we obtain is that uh, one percentage point increase in mortgage denial rates leads to 2.3% increase in housing rents, a decrease in home ownership that is around 2.4, and then a strong increase in for multifamily uh, building permits. We think that these results uh, highlight several things. First, it may be that an intended consequence of regulation, basically we have tried to make mortgage credit safer, about making mortgage credit safer, maybe we did tight supply of credit, this has created uh, a fraction of the, of the increase in, in housing rents. That's one, one lesson we want to get from the paper. And then for the people who are more in the investor community, we think this has implications because real investment funds, uh, re real estate investment funds, they have developed very fast. Some of them related to multifamily housing. And we think that this big increase in supply that is here is going to put a cap on the increase on rents. In fact, we should expect the rents to start going down. If you follow inflation, you see that housing and rents have been a big driver of inflation. So we think that also the Fed should pay attention to this kind of results because this is claiming, in our opinion, that inflationary pressures from housing rents are going to slow down. Okay, that's the way in which we interpret our, our results. And then the question is, okay, what's the, the reason why we have this tight credit supply? And here we focus on the, on the big four banks. Why we focus on the big four banks that are Bank of America, Citibank, JP Morgan, and Wells Fargo? For two reasons. Dodd Frank uh, created the stress testing, and the system, and these banks were classified as systemic. This implies new regulatory requirements and basically some kind of instruction to try to avoid the mortgage risk or at least risk. And then also, and this is a new part that they started in 2011, is that the Department of Justice started to invoke the False Claims Act in the mortgage markets. Basically, this created what people call putback risk. It's basically saying that every time there are defaults. The Department of Justice sometimes have claimed that the banks have to pay for this, these defaults. And we saw that all the big board for banks settled in 2012. And then each one of them, they, they have like, a, like a, 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 a dealing with the Department of Justice. And then the theory we want to, to test is motivated by this kind of comments from the CEOs of Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan. And you are, what the CEO of Wells Fargo said, that is basically the same comments that the CEO of JP Morgan said, say, look, this program of putting back risk uh, on us basically is going to create a contraction of credit supply. This contraction of credit supply is going to mean that homeowners cannot get credit, they will have to rent, and this is going to create some kind of, of undeserved population in the mortgage market. So this was the prediction of the CEOs, and in this paper, we try to test this. So when you try to go to the theory, we notice that we need something else that just what the CEOs are saying. So we agree, maybe there is some shock that is going to lead to a tight credit supply of the big four banks. Like the CEOs are saying, more households are going to deny credit. And then this is a key element we need because we know that there are other banks. And in fact, yesterday Nancy Wallace was showing that there are many new players in mortgage markets. So there has to be some friction in the economy to substitute from the big four banks or from the banks to the new players. In this paper, we provide what we think is a strong evidence that age is an important friction because if you see most of the new players are online lenders, what we found is that elder MSAs, in which you maybe think that age is a kind of a barrier to use the new technologies, these are the MSAs that are more affected by, by our estimates of credit supply. And then we also find that barriers to competition in, in between mortgage brokers and also between the non-banks is another friction that prevents the, the, the borrowers from switching from the 
lenders that are tightening standards towards the new lenders. And then if, 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 if we have a shock to create supply in some lender, we have frictions to substitute, this is an increase in the demand for rental. If the demand for rents increase, but the supply of rents takes some time to adjust, this may explain the increase in, in rents that we obtain. This also implies that home ownership is going to go down. That is something we find. It's going to imply that the, in, the, in the rental markets, vacancies are going to go down. And then supply at some moment, see the increases in rent and say, wait, oh, this is the moment to build. And we find a strong effect in the construction of multifamily housing that is basically most of the increase in the rental supply. Then to give you some evidence of why we started with the big four banks, first, when you look across MSAs, the big four banks in 2008, it means before the kind of credit supply shock, before the retreat, they play an important role in, 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 in many MSAs. You see MSAs in which the share of application was close to 60% of the market. Okay? And then what we did a correlation between uh, where the big four banks are or where the housing rents are increasing, we found this. This is just correlation. The goal of the paper is to try to go for causation. But what we see is that the MSAs where the big four banks were more present, these are the MSAs in which they increase faster the housing, the housing rents. And we thought maybe there is a, a causal channel here going from a great tightening of supply here uh, to, the, to the rents. So, this is an empirical paper, and the way we are going to try to go for causality is we are going to try to control for all the borrower characteristics to isolate credit supply channels. So the idea is we want to measure the propensity to deny a loan. And we want to make different groups. And we are going to see the propensity to deny by the big four banks versus the non-big four banks. And this is what we plot here. If you can see, this is the propensity to deny of the big four banks. Here, the reference is 2007 in the non-big four banks. That's like the the group uh, relative to the one we compare the changes. And you can see that around 2011, that this is the moment stress testing starts and the Department of Justice starts to, to, um, to, to sue the banks in the, in, the, in the mortgage market. We see this tightening of the big four banks. And then you can think, well, this tightening has to happen especially in the borrowers that are in the margin of home ownership. That's FHA. So you see that here the tightening is much stronger. And then you could think that the other group of borrowers that are in the margin of home ownership are the minorities, like blacks and Hispanics. And then we see the same thing is that the big four banks increase this uh, denial rate. This is the propensity to say no to a mortgage application by more to the blacks and Hispanics than the other set of of lenders in, in housing markets. So then our empirical strategy is when we have isolated a measure of credit supply, that is this propensity to deny, what we employ is the cross-sectional heterogeneity in the location of these banks. And we say, what are the MSAs that should be more affected by a tightening of credit supply? Well, the MSAs where these banks are more present. And this is the share of the big four banks in 2008. Then this is our proxy for the extra tightening of these banks. And then we see how this, like an instrumental variable for denial rates, affect the variables that we care about. And there's the moment in which even if we control for many things, like for example, there are many other alternative controls we need to control for population, income, past foreclosure, past trends, the age of the population. So there are many other alternative drivers of, 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 of housing markets. But even if we control for them, we find these strong results that an increase in the denial rates implies an increase in the, in, the, in the housing rents, implies a decrease in home ownership uh, rates. The vacancy rate, the results have a lot of noise. So the sign is according to the theory, but we cannot conclude the uh, significance. And, uh, and this strong result that is consistent, no matter how you control, that supply react uh, to the increase um, in rents. And then, and then we see a boom of applications for multifamily permits. And then we think that any theory of this tightening of credit supply has to take into account that there are new mortgage players and why these new mortgage players have not been able to, to take uh, the applications from the, from the existing players. And we think that these are two, 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 two frictions that are there. We think that these are transitory frictions, why we think this is important. We think that access to, um, to weekend loans, all these kind of internet uh, companies for some Households take some time, and what we create is proxies for these kind of barriers to use internet. One is some MSAs have less or more expensive access to internet than others, and then some MSAs have elder population relative to other MSAs. These are the MSAs that are more affected by the, by the big four banks because we think it's harder for the online lenders to enter there. And then we think that there is also a kind of a link between mortgage brokers 
and banks. No? And our intuition is that usually to get a mortgage, you go through a broker, and the broker puts you in contact with the bank. So maybe the brokers that they have a stickier link uh, with a friend in a bank, even if the bank is tighter, you keep sending the customers. And since there are different regulations in the US states in the, uh, among bro mortgage brokers, we try to see if this affects, uh, if this creates a kind of a friction to substitute across, across lenders. Then another thing that we look, if you look mortgage markets, co-op have increased very fast. Basically, the big, the big ba banks retreat, and the new players are co-ops and, uh, and I would say online lenders. So we look the degree of competition between these, uh, these lenders. We try to control for other things. What we find very significant is uh, uh, age of the population, access to internet, especially the price difference in the cost of internet. That is basically what drives the difference here in this, in this index. We control for many other factors that are like a difference in land, in, in land regulation, zoning, other things that are in a Wharton index. And when we look uh, for the, um, when we look for the frictions between the non-banks, what we find is that when the alternative lenders are not very competitive, okay, the effects on home ownership are stronger. So then to conclude, what we try to do in this paper, like in a, in a, in a causal way, is that it seems to be a link between the tightening of uh, standards by the systemic banks and a contraction of credit supply, because we find evidence of some frictions. We think that this is going to be somehow temporary, because we expect these frictions to disappear as people get more used to internet, for example, and also because construction is coming, and we think that this has implications for the real estate investment trust industry and for inflation. That's basically what we do in this paper. Um, our discussant is Paul Willen of the Boston Fed, who has the unenviable task of discussing three papers in 15 minutes. I don't have any extra slides. Oh, there are. OK. <clears throat> so I wanted to thank the organizers for uh, uh, inviting me to discuss three papers in 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> And, 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 and then there's, it's not just to discuss three papers in 15 minutes, but also to, to do, it, do it well, uh, to do it, to give a big picture, uh, provocative uh, insights into the mortgage market. Anyway, l before I start, uh, I'm speaking today as a researcher and as a concerned citizen and not as a representative of the Boston Fed or the Federal Reserve System. So when I say we, I don't mean uh, <laughs> Janet and me. Um, okay. So um, I'm going to discuss actually the first two papers and then the third. Uh, and uh, I'm going to try and stir controversy by saying these are two uh, excellent papers. Uh, they were two excellent presentations. Um, and what I think is not clear uh, is that they, in some sense, are diametrically opposed in the conclusions uh, that they lead one to about the financial crisis. Uh, so let me illustrate that by giving you uh, a little background on what the debate is uh, in the literature about the mortgage boom. And I think the starting point, the conventional wisdom of the boom, has always started with this idea that there was a credit expansion. So a, for a given borrower, it became uh, easier to borrow, um, uh, either because the loan-to-value constraint was relaxed or the payment-to-income constraint was relaxed. And the, uh, the kind of big picture thing is we imagine a world there are constrained borrowers and there are constrained households and unconstrained households. So the constrained households have low income uh, and uh, low credit scores. So the low income households tend to spend a much bigger fraction of their income on housing. So they're much more likely to be constrained. And so what happens when you expand credit? What happens when you expand credit is that's going to benefit the people who were constrained. Right? If you could already borrow as much as you want, what difference does it make whether uh, we make it easier for you to borrow? And so what we, uh, the general view was, until relatively recently, was that there was a relative shift in debt from unconstrained households to constrained households. And uh, so the literature, a lot of the literature was devoted not to documenting the credit expansion that was taken as given and this relative shift. Most of it was devoted to arguing about why there was a credit expansion. So there was a securitization. There were people on the left said there was too little regulation. People on the right said there was too much regulation. 
And, uh, and then there were uh, the minority of people like me who said, uh, and my co-authors, who said that the real issue here was that people were optimistic about, or both that the lenders were optimistic about house prices. And the more optimistic you are about house prices, the less you're concerned about, for example, the borrower's ability to pay the loan back because you think the collateral will take care of you. Okay, so um, uh, I think what's happened now is that there's been, uh, in many ways, largely due to Antoinette, there's been a big effort to revisit this question of whether there was actually a relative shift uh, in debt. Okay, so what is the starting point for Antoinette? So she didn't uh, really go into this, uh, which is surprising, uh, because uh, just so you know, not everybody uh, agrees uh, with Antoinette. Uh, and um, in particular, um, uh, there's the origin, the evidence that people had that there was this credit shift. The most cited paper, really a, one of the most cited papers about the crisis, this paper by Mian and Sufi, in which they said, in fact, from 2002 to 2005, is the only period in the last 18 years in which income and mortgage credit are negatively uh, uh, correlated. And that's this picture, and I'll just say this is the, it's one of the most misleading pictures ever to appear <laughs> anywhere. Um, and so what I'm going to do is try and show you what, the, what they're really picking up in the data here. Uh, and so what are they picking up in the data? What they're picking up is, so what they're looking at is the total dollars in a zip code of new purchase mortgage loans, the dollars. So it's all the money spent by everybody in that, all the money borrowed by everybody in that zip code, for example, in a year. And so what are they really picking up? Uh, so the blue dots here, it's a little hard to read, are 2001. And this is the relationship between income and debt. And so not surprisingly, zip codes with more income, people get more debt. So that's 2001. And so what happens between 2001 and 2006? It's not the, in the co income and mortgage credit were never negatively correlated or anything close to that. What happened was that the slope of the line changed. And when they do this in growth rates, they somehow come up with this negative correlation. And it gives the impression that there was a negative correlation between income and debt. There was never any such thing. What happened was that the slope changed. So what does this mean? If this is uh, Somerville and this is Wellesley, basically the loans in relative terms went up in Somerville and down in Wellesley. And that seemed consistent with the idea that what we were looking at was a response to relaxed constraints. Because basically, where are you seeing the debt go up? You're seeing it go up in the places where we would think people are more likely to be constrained. OK, so Antoinette's, their big insight was that this is total purchase dollars is the product of the number of loans times the average amount. And the constraint story, the way people were thinking about it, is a story about average amounts. And basically what people had in mind was that people in um, individual borrowers in uh, Somerville were borrowing more and individual borrowers in uh, Weston were borrowing less. But when you go to the data and you separate out the amounts from the numbers, what you get is that the amounts were staying exactly, the re relative amounts that people were borrowing were staying exactly the same. What was happening was that there was more loans being taken out in uh, Somerville relative to Weston. Okay, and so this evidence here, this panel, that certainly was the way a lot of people, including Mian and Sufi in their book, interpreted that figure. They said it showed that something strange was happening with underwriting. I think this picture basically killed that theory. But that doesn't mean that there isn't something going on over here. And Mian and Sufi subsequently argued that what's happening in this picture is it's not the intensive margin. It's not that low-income people are taking out bigger loans. It's that all kinds of people in low-income areas who formerly couldn't get any loans are transitioning into the housing market. So we went and revisited this uh, in a paper writing for the last year. Uh, and we went to the credit bureau data, and you pick up this effect here in the credit bureau data. This is essentially mirrors that picture. 
And what it shows you is that the relationship between income and new mortgage originations, basically this is Somerville, the mortgage originations are going up in Somerville in relative terms and down in Weston. That's the number of originations. The problem is that the same thing is going on with terminations. So basically, these two are just canceling each other out. And in the end, there's no change in the relative stock of debt in low income areas and in high income areas. OK, so in some sense, there are now new facts about the cross section of debt in the boom. As I said, this paper is important in its own right, but it's also important because it led to a lot of research revising our view of the boom. So this is from a new paper by Stefania Albanese and Yaramir Nosal, and they show that if we look by credit score, debt grew roughly equally by the three high credit score bins and um, uh, less for the lowest. Uh, this is a paper by Neil Buddha on equity extraction, and what he found, he, Buddha and Keyes, what they found was that equity extraction, people had thought that the home equity extraction was going to low credit score borrowers, but actually it was going up for everybody and in some ways going up more for high, the highest and the second highest bin of credit scores than for the low one. This is from uh, our paper. One of the things we looked at was just the direct measure, are more people transitioning into home ownership in low credit scores uh, um, for people with low credit scores? And so what we're looking at here is the first, the, the probability of the first transition into mortgage ship. So people who've never had a mortgage before transitioning into having a mortgage. And what you see is that the boom years, the probability was going down. And um, so the, we have this idea that the boom was this period where all these people who previously hadn't owned homes transitioned into home ownership. But actually, you see um, uh, the opposite uh, is happening. And finally, if you put this all together, if debt is growing by the same amount for all income, the same percentage growth for all income groups, high income people have so much more debt to begin with, it means most of the debt that was added during the boom went to high income people. And so going forward, the new facts we have to explain is, and this is how I'll turn to Greenwald, all of the, um, uh, it has to explain why it is the people who were least likely to be constrained. These are people who have high income, they have a cred median credit score of something like 750. Why are they taking out so much additional debt? Okay, so the Greenwald paper is the key ingredient here is a focus on the flow debt constraint. So this in and of itself is a very, very important improvement in the way we think about things. There's a lot of empirical research now that confirms that it's the flow burden of debt that matters, not the stock. So there's a paper, new paper by some, well, they were grad students at Harvard, Peter Ganong and Pascal Noel. They compared two policies, a policy to cut the monthly payment on your mortgage with a policy to cut the monthly payment and cut the principal. And what they found was that at cutting the principal had no effect. All of the effect is driven by this flow budget constraint. And this has always been in mortgage underwriting, this is where Daniel's paper is really uh, right on, the flow budget, that's the way lenders think about debt. They think about it as a flow. If you, the, what's interesting is when, you, when they're underwriting your mortgage, they, uh, they take the stock of wealth and they measure debt, so of, of assets or a stock, and debt is a flow, and I know this because at some point when I was getting a mortgage, they wanted me to take out a loan, uh, take out a loan um, and deposit the money in my account so that I ended up with more wealth uh, and a bigger flow of, um, but because I was, I, had a, I was very low on the payment to income constraint, but I didn't have, they wanted me to have more wealth. Uh, so um, I, I'm not kidding. And so, um, and I went along with it. Um, uh, so, um, uh, okay, that's what's so great about mortgages. It's all it's your own experience. All right, so the challenge for Daniel is the cross-sectional implications. The model implies a big shift in debt to constrained households. So the way that Daniel defines uh, borrowers, uh, borrowers in the model is borrowers, so it's not anyone who has a mortgage. It's someone who has a mortgage and who doesn't have uh, financial assets. But if you look and you go to the SCF and you use that definition, what you see is the people in his model who are called savers, they load up on debt just as much as the people who are borrowers. Okay, so 
this is not to say the new view of the credit expansion. It's not to say that constraints don't matter, but it's, they matter in a different way. So the old view was that we had low-income borrowers and high-income borrowers, and what subprime did was to help the low-income borrowers go on this debt-fueled binge. That was the old view. I think the new view is that the high-income people went on a debt-fueled binge, and the low-income people needed subprime basically to keep up. So or not, no one is saying that the constraints weren't relaxed, but the effect of the relaxing of the constraints simply allowed the low-income people to keep up with the high-income people. Had there been no relaxation of the constraint, basically we would have had a big shift in debt to high-income uh, households. All right, so let me conclude by talking about the uh, Pedro and Michael's paper. Um, so why is this all important? So this credit constraints view that has dominated our thinking about this, that the event that led to the boom in debt, that the key event was an exogenous relaxation of constraints, that view led to policy. So is to restrict credit to marginal borrowers. So when I showed you this picture before, what I focused on was the boom. That's over here. But what has happened since the boom is that the transitions into mortgage ship uh, have gone down across the board, but especially down here for the people in the lowest FICO bin. So these people were transitioning into home ownership at, all the way back in 2001. There was no change in the, their transitions into home ownership. Now it's hard to tell here. This is zero. They are not transitioning in at all. And so what happened is that in, because people believed that it was all about these constraints, what we did is essentially introduce uh, uh, tighter constraints that were tighter than anything that existed even before the boom. So it has always been the case that low credit score borrowers could transition into home ownership. It is now not the case. So the conclusions of Pedro and Michael's paper basically are that what this has done is totally transformed the housing market. Is that basically what we're doing now is to solve a problem that in some sense wasn't the problem. Uh, we now have tighter mortgage standards, have increased demand for rental housing, led to higher rents, depressed home ownership rates, greater construction of multifamily housing, and lower rental vacancies. Those are all the kind of unintended consequences of trying to, to achieve a policy outcome that somehow uh, is based on a misunderstanding uh, of what happened. And the question is, uh, is this tightening of credit now an appropriate policy response? Okay. Oh, wait, I have one more slide. I guess what I wanted to just, we'll, we'll take questions, and I think probably, un unless you all uh, have weak vocal cords, um, we should just shout it out, and, uh, and the authors are all up here to respond, but I think we could just have a general discussion, so. I'll call on people just to keep order. Go ahead. Could you just go back to that one? Hi, I'm Tanya Zurikin. Could you just go back to your last slide? Mm -hmm. And I saw this in several of the other graphs. So you talk about the effect of policy change, but that those bottom two quintiles have been going down since the before the actual bust of the housing cycle starting in 2006. And so, we're effectively down to almost zero by 2011. So I'm not seeing where policy was a contributor. So the policy is, the, is, is coming in here in 07 and 08, right? That's when the, that's when the, I mean, in other words, it's the response to, right, the subprime market vanishes here, right? And I mean, it's completely gone by the end of 2007, right? So that's the policy change. I mean, whatever you want to call it, the fact that the, and maybe the, uh, the, the fact that we've gotten rid of a whole, that whole section of the mortgage market, right, that came, whatever you want to call it, policy, right, that came, you can look at Fannie and Freddie, you look all across the board, they just stopped lending to people with low, uh, with low uh, credit scores. Lori Goodman, if she's still here, uh, could go on and on uh, on that subject. Uh, to, uh, to channel Lori a little bit. <laughs> As Paul was saying, I mean, you know, the policy changes that people are very concerned about, like Paul was saying, is number one, that the underwriting standards um, for, that Fannie and Freddie have put onto mortgages 
has changed and it affects, it's just even the cost of underwriting has gone up because just the reporting fields that you have to fill in have more than quadrupled and which makes therefore the, the cost of underwriting more expensive and that's particularly difficult to recoup for smaller loans. On top of it we have, you know, Laurie was actually pointing to this yesterday, the put back risk that the DOJ has now put on Benny and Freddie seems particularly troubled, I mean, or um, important for, for low income mortgages. Um, and therefore, lots of banks are now not underwriting at all um, low income and low FICO loans. Um, I mean, just to say one other thing, Paul was already hinting at this, right? Pre 2000 or even 2001, a lot of the lending was done by FHA. So subprime seems to have supplanted a lot of FHA activity. And then FHA didn't come back directly after the boom. Now, I mean, we might not want that, but I'm just saying that, you know, kind of, there was a subprime supplanted a, a, a separate type of mortgage mark, uh, <coughs> origination function that then was not brought back when subprime was shut. Yeah, relative to that question, I think it's important. In our work, for example, what we see is that the increase in the propensity to deny is especially tighter for FHA borrowers and for minorities, black and Hispanics. And it's important that this <coughs> complement what Antoinette was saying. There is heterogeneity between the lenders. The lenders that are more exposed to the unintended consequence of regulation are the ones that react the more. And we think that this is pointing out that there has to be some causality between a group of lenders reacting differently when the lenders that react in a particular way is consistent with the theory. And these results are most sharp around 2010, 2011, when a lot of the major regulatory overhauls went through. So I have a question, um, two comments. Um, one is I think uh, this, this, uh, these, these results that show how it's gotten to the broader market are really important. So that's, that's important. I think there's a parallel in the financial side where in some ways you could draw out the surprise of the prime is in some sense the same as the surprise on the AAA tranches in the, in the sector. So you need the marginal to get to the main parts um, and just sort of bringing out the externalities because somehow the price externalities of the house prices, maybe the subprime added to that to get to the prime. Um, and I didn't see that captured in the model. So that was one point. A second one, this is on um, Daniel's paper, which is the LTV constraints. What I didn't understand, so if I relax those and I see the prices fall, if I relax that, do I get to buy another house though? So I, you know, that was like, do I have this second effect, which is, might be linked to how Antoinette gets the, you know, the major part of the how, you know, household sector really increasing debt. And second homes are, another issue and I don't know where those show up in this on this chart. Yeah. Oh sure. Um, right. So the idea here is that in some sense you can you could buy whatever you want um, in terms of multiple homes. I guess the <coughs> the regulation is a little different if you're buying as an investor. But um, the point here is that if you're restricted by your income, that's where you run into trouble. So once you've hit the point at which you can't borrow anymore given your income Relaxing loan to value really will not let you buy um, another house. The only thing it will let you do is put a smaller down payment on what you already want. Or in the model, what's going to happen at equilibrium is you just don't need as much collateral to back kind of the same loan you're already getting. So that's why having both the constraints is really important. If you had a world where you only had LTV and nobody was income constrained, you would get exactly what you said, whereas you sort of loosen these <laughs> leverage ratios, people just go out and buy more houses, bigger houses, that's going to generate a big boom. And in the model, if I shut down the payment income, it does. But once you're income constrained, you're kind of stuck. And that's what really shuts that, that down and causes the opposite effect. Yeah, so on um, a question about the, uh, your paper and the correlation with regulation, especially. I mean, the intonation was just as the actual change in the underwriting standards happened much earlier than we were saying. It happened, it happened in May 2008. And that was right at uh, the huge loss in Fannie and Freddie in the second quarter in Fannie and Freddie, where they changed their pricing of the product that they were willing to buy. This is, thanks, 
Olympics at and pointing this out. Um, and then that was followed up with all the banks knew full well that they had reps and warranties on those loans, and therefore they were liable for these liabilities. And the long period of time it took to get enforcement on the putbacks on the buybacks. And that lag had a lot more to do with the pricing and the ratcheting back of access on the part of the large banks than did stress testing. Because it started much earlier. I mean, there was no stress testing in 2008. So I think you need to be a little bit careful about the channels that were actually pushing back on the banks, because the banks were big providers the Fannie and Freddie during this period. So from 2006 to 2008, a lot of Fannie and Freddie's exposure were to the banks you're kind of pointing out. Either through mergers, a lot of it was mergers, but they were on the hook for buybacks. So it was partly the liability that was suddenly priced, and the fact that the enforcement didn't happen right away, so it wasn't in the newspaper. But the liability was definitely there from 2005, and the banks responded to it. And that had nothing to do with it. That's a very good point, and we, we, so in our paper we don't, and we can't exactly pin down a specific regulation which is inducing this, but I think our results, it's important to note, are as much driven by a tightening of these big four or systemically important banks as it is by a relative, uh, a relative tightening um, and uh, a loosening <coughs> of uh, non-big four banks and other lenders. So if, if you noticed, I, I think, uh, or in, in our paper, we showed that around uh, in, in 2008 and 2007, there was uh, a higher propensity to deny for both big four and non-big four, but since then, there has been a bit of loosening among the non-big four banks, whereas that, is not, that behavior is not occurring among the big four. So it's, it's, it's exactly right. I mean, we're, we're picking up a tightness around 07 and 08, and a little bit of loosening for the non-systemic banks, but we're not picking that up for the systemic banks. Uh, and you're exactly right, we can't pin down the source of this relative stringency to any particular stress test. But what we see is that the years, that is basically the big increase in tightening seems to happen around 2011, at least in the, in the, in the results that we find. If the, this is the moment. The, the, the relative, the relative, relative tightening. tightening. The relative tightening, which is the spread between. I have a question to Antoinette and Daniel. Great paper presentation, by the way. And we have to quote you the baseline. Psychologists, perhaps I'm fairly. Um, I think people can't understand a million dollar house or 200,000, but I can understand, I, don't have, I can't afford $1,600. I have to pay for food and for clothing and for cars. So will PCI matter? Because people might already understand that. That's sort of a psychological question. And similarly, um, well, in the data, where uh, wealthy people do refis, and basically they're borrowing from the bank of me, and therefore investing. So you're doing a refi on your million dollar house and buying more houses or buying the stock market which is going up 20% a year. Um, so it, are people using the money the same way? Um, and that's so almost a psychological question. And are they self-aware regarding PCI? Sure, um, so I think you're, you're right. One way you can think about it is that you can kind of get these PCI-like effects even without a strict constraint. If people say, gosh, look, I just can't afford to make this payment all of a sudden interest rates fall, you say, oh, now I can afford it. And that, that could be another explanation for why you could get some of these demand effects that wouldn't be purely regulatory, but could come from just people's own budgeting. Um, uh, so I think that's definitely possible. Laura? I mean, just quickly on the refi. Uh, so we, what I showed you briefly in the presentation, and then as Paul was saying, there is now a paper by Neil Buda, like really looking at refi. So you see that refis obviously went up dramatically, but in particular after 2002, 2003, when the interest rate dropped for the first time in a long time. Um, but even there, we see that it is the richer people that are taking the big cash up refis, right? And they are the ones, you know, more in terms of the stock of average, more level. Now, unfortunately, it is. Well, maybe you can say, fortunately, we are not in Scandinavia, so we don't know everything everybody does with you know, their <laughs> consumption, <laughs> their liabilities and everything. So we have very bad, I mean, very poor data in knowing what exactly the people invest in. There are some people that suggest that probably people, like you were saying, maybe took the money and bought a second home or bought a holiday home or something like that. Probably it had effects on consumption.
question, but that we don't know so well. In fact, in many studies actually shows that the homeowners expanded consumption very similar to the renters in the areas where prices, house prices went up a lot, which goes back to what Paul was saying. Maybe it is a lot of it was consumption based on the perception that everything was going up. But we just don't know exactly what people did with the money that they took out. At least I haven't seen a good paper that really Laura, do you ever have a question? So I think, um, I'd like to comment on the last paper. I think it got to absolutely the right conclusions, but I think it did so um, in a way that was a little bit overly simplistic. In particular, the um, emphasis on denial rates has always bothered me quite a bit because it sort of um, confuses supply and demand. So denial rates were really, really high in 2007 because you had so many marginal borrowers applying for mortgages. And in fact, um, denial rates you know, sort of dropped sort of across the, uh, across the board in subsequent years, which your, which your figures show. Um, and sort of using denial rates as the basis for the amount, and you know, I mean, you showed the differences between the big four and the other, which I think is absolutely right. The use of denial rates just sort of bothers me because denial rates were the highest when credit was the loosest, just because you had so many bar marginal borrowers applying. You might want to just look at other things as well. The reason we went for denial rates is because it's supply in the sense that the, the lender gets an application and it's only the, the lender who decides if you deny or not. And the problem with, uh, with origination is that you also have the borrower <coughs> because there are some borrowers that say no when the, when the lender come back. With no, the, but it, you, know, you sort of have the widest, when credit standards are the loosest, you have the widest applicant pool. And I think the one thing that we sort of, oh, this is sort of a general, more general, comment when we talk about mortgage credit, I think the one thing that we've never, that we, the one change in the process is this, is the pre-approval. Now before a mortgage broker will, uh, will work with you to show you houses, they want to know that you've been pre-approved for a mortgage. And I think there's a lot of screening that takes place at that level where we have absolutely no data whatsoever. But I think that's really, that's really important. But I just, you know, the, the use of denial rates just sort of bugs me. So we can control for that. So I, I, I liked uh, Paul's um, summary slide about the transition from the old view to the new view of credit extension. <coughs> but um, it leads me to the puzzle. One of the things that I think gave me and in Sufi's account a lot of credibility early on was the simple fact that uh, during the boom, prices were going up the fastest in lower income neighborhoods and lower income neighborhoods. <coughs> so under the new view, I wonder if any of the authors want to comment. Under the new view, what accounts for that? Why, why did we see the heterogeneity in house price growth that we saw during the boom? Do we have a new understanding of that? Uh, so my view on this is the following. Um, what we have seen in our data is that, um, so the heterogeneity I can, we can explain because um, a lot of higher income people bought in poorer neighborhoods. So what happened is that when house prices went up, and they went up you know, across the board, even in very expensive neighborhoods, it looks like a lot of, you know, say, middle income or, yeah, uh, middle income people might have been priced out of the richest or the most expensive neighborhoods and then started moving to neighborhoods that were you know, say, like, think about Boston, right? The South End started really booming during the boom because maybe the people who originally would have bought in Back Bay moved to the South End. <coughs> and they couldn't afford South End, they moved to South Boston. And uh, there is even, there is some work by uh, Eric Hurst that seems to suggest that it's in particular lower income neighborhoods next to very expensive neighborhoods where you saw this house price so I feel the heterogeneity, I, have to, you know, I feel we can address. To be very honest, the part that our story still doesn't address is the, the longitudinal increase, right? I mean, I cannot explain. Um, our story and the expectations are built on, built on the fact that prices were going up and people were buying into these increased asset values. And, right, I mean, so what triggered this increase in house prices longitudinally, right? Our story doesn't address it. Um, I, I appeal to things like you know the house, the, the fact that there was a savings glut, that there was you know just credit you know more generally coming in, 
Um, and that's, you know, in the US, maybe you know, more people, more, more <coughs> outsiders was, were also buying houses, right? I mean, the, the same is that story. But the story where I think our story still, in a way, is looking, you know, for <laughs> an explanation is the longitudinal. Just, John, one other thing to keep in mind is, in general, house prices in low-income areas are much more cyclical than in high-income areas. So if you take a Brookline and Chelsea and you index them to 100 in 1989, Chelsea falls something like 70% in the bus, and Brookline falls 5%. But then if you go to 2005, they're right on top of each other again. Uh, so that was one of the things is that you can you can predict. I mean, I, I don't I go use should use the word predict with John Campbell. Uh, the but the point is here is you can there there, there seems to be some relationship there uh, that I think is just generally true that house prices rise more in low income areas than high income areas. Some of it could be what what um, Antoine is talking about. I mean, just just in general, you see in Boston, I mean, it would be it's a little like you know, people who would, would have bought in Brookline are now moving to Newton, and people who would have bought in Newton are moving to Dedham, and, and so forth. Um, just a couple of comments. I really enjoyed all the, the papers. I thought I'd add a couple of things for context, maybe starting building, extending on, on, on Lori's comments. I think thinking about this area, um, one of the things to really keep in mind, and I think maybe this chart of Paul that might help here, is that there, consider that there's been an actual change in demand. The demand curve for housing has shifted. And part of this, you think back to the, to the Great Depression and people from that era, you know, and how they forever looked at credit, you know, going forward. I think that there's a certain learning here about what happened in this housing crisis and what can happen if you get overextended in housing. I think it particularly manifests itself in, in uh, lower income and first time um, you know, borrower uh, groups. So that's that's an important part of the thing that uh, the think about here. People, and then nobody talked about sort of the, you know, the generational change, millennials and so forth, and how there's a certain difference of, of, of taste or acquisition or household formation that also is explaining this. But one other thing I wanted to, to uh, mention is a lot of talk about underwriting standards and other underwriting standards. And this is, it was all sort of framed in the context of qualification to get a loan up front. But another thing that has changed dramatically and it, and it, and it really had its pivot point in late 2010 going into 2011, and it can change this, is about mortgage servicing. We have dramatically changed mortgage servicing requirements, the liability associated with it, the cost associated with it. And in 2010, I mean, most mortgage servicing was in the big four banks. And so who were the targets, you know, of, of all this when, you know, when the, you know, the robo-signing and so forth started, that's, that's where it was. So that's another event that took place that matters. But I think that this is another sort of permanent change in the landscape that affects underwriting. It's not just sort of where are you in, you know, um, you know, underwriting at the time of a loan application, but the, the risk to the to the lender slash servicer if a bar if a borrower goes bad two years later it's really change dramatically. Compensation for paying for that hasn't changed. So that's another dynamic that's affecting mortgage credit. Definitely. So I'm, I'm wondering some of the policy responses for to go to things like QRM and to do risk retention. And you mentioned that maybe these are misguided in some sense. They don't solve the underlying problem. Can you talk about maybe some unintended consequences of having those regulations when that doesn't solve the problem that uh, was manifest during this time? Do you have any thoughts about that? Me? Well, anyone. You, 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 you're well, going to the point, so I'm asking you. Oh, yeah, you, no, no, I, no. I, um, the, uh, is your question, um, uh, is your I mean, the unintended, well, that's unintended consequences of you know, decreasing home ownership. Uh, that wasn't the intention of the policy, and it just in the sense that what we're sort of saying is there was nothing that the increase in home ownership was not inherently unsustainable. It's not that the people who were getting those, that would be, I'm not saying it's necessarily true, but um, that would be one view. I, I mean, I think another question 
uh, would be what is an appropriate uh, policy response. And I think uh, you know, the the it all depends on what exactly it is you're you're concerned about. And I guess if the concern here is what do we do to protect the financial system, I think that's always been a somewhat separate question in the sense of how do you you can have a lot of defaults, you can a lot of things go wrong, and not have a financial crisis. And so the, I think a lot of the, the well the well intent I think the, the good part of the response, the policy response, has been that part. I think going after lenders. Uh, you know, and this sort of idea that the lenders behaved in an unethical way when they were lending. I think that's where we've gotten into trouble. Yeah, Paul, I just have a quick question on, on your chart here. Uh, you know, the bottom two quintiles, it makes it appear that, you know, we're sort of uh, out of the woods now and we're not making the, the riskiest forms of loans. Does that include explicitly backed loans by the federal government, FHA, RHA, Absolutely. Yeah, this comes from the credit bureau data. So what's nice here is this is absolutely everything, right? And so this is just transitions into, these are people who, in the data, we, they, you, can, you can see they've never had a mortgage before, and then they have a mortgage. It could be any type of mortgage. So it would include FHA and Because FHA's FHA volumes are up wild. Um, so yeah, but remember what happened home. with FHA, which is it, what they did was to take a lot of, I mean, they, one of the things that was always a Simpsons paradox thing where you saw the, the credit scores go way up for FHA. People interpreted that as raising their standards. But when you look, they were actually, um, uh, their volume, basically what they were doing was just pulling in an enormous number of people from every other type of, uh, every other, and basically any, most first time home buyers now go through FHA, even people with very high credit scores. The last one comment. We, we claim that we identify one factor driving demand for housing rentals, but reference can be another factor. We try to control for that. We think an important implication from this paper also is how do you react with this situation? And here it seems that the market is providing supply, and supply can take care of the housing rents. If you see the election in November, there are many MSAs that they want to go back to the control in rents. <laughs> Freeman has this book, Roof of, of, of or Ceilings. So it seems that in this paper we identify that markets, when you see an increase in housing rents, supply react, and maybe sometimes the best reaction of policy is not to go, okay, now the problem is with rents, let's put a cap on rents. That seems to be what is in, in the ballot in November in many MSAs. So I think the strong reaction of supply we think is an important policy lesson. Happen, did the data permit you to look at uh, the problem and uh, the implications on a geographic basis? And if so, uh, were any of your conclusions different for the Northeast versus the West Coast, or the Southwest versus the Middle West? And in particular, um, you know, the, the policy that was carried out with the effects different for different parts of the country. I, I don't know if it did permit you. And if it did, I, I'm not sure if you had enough time to look at it. Okay. So that's a good question. Yes, the data does permit. Um, we did look, uh, I mean, not, not obviously you know, state by state, but you know, broadly, like you said, but regionally, we found actually that the effects I showed you are pretty much in all regions. They are there. Um, so it's not like you know some regions. So of course, there are some regions that have very little house price appreciation, even through the boom, right? I mean, especially. Um, Rural areas had actually very little of it. The Midwest, exactly very little of it. So <coughs> these effects that I was showing you weren't there, just because you know it was you know very much mm -hmm. focused in the uh, in the areas where house prices were going up more. There is an interesting paper that has looked on the flip side of these type of regional effects, which is that so there's a paper by Eric Hurst at Chicago who um, kind of points out that the fact that say, you know, Fannie and Freddie and all our housing market interventions are completely region free, right? They kind of t don't take into account that the typical say default rate in some areas is completely different, right, across areas. We are giving the same subsidies, um, you know, when underwriting a, a, a mortgage in, yeah, like, let's say in the Midwest, then in the Northeast or in California. So you actually are giving 
um, very differential subsidies to different parts of the country by not pricing that risk. Now, if, if the policymakers intend to do that, fine, right, if they are aware of it. But if they are, they are not, then it would be something we should actually be much more aware of. Could I ask a follow-up question? Mm -hmm. um, I think in your chart, you, uh, you show the total amount of defaulted debt by income strata. Uh, I think somewhere in the discussion, somebody mentioned, which I would intuitively, is that the lower income people have, on average, smaller mortgages Absolutely. than the higher. With the total number of defaults, total number of defaults, uh, do, do those follow the same pattern as the default on total debt? Right, okay. right, I see what you're saying. Um, so first of all, completely right, right? Poor, uh, lower income people, on average, have something like a $75,000 mortgage. Middle income people, more between like around 250,000, sure. right? So, um, now, what I showed you is the dollar weighted amount of defaults, right? And what I showed you is that the, the dollar weighted, so the you know, volume of debt, the default was much bigger in the high income groups in post-2007 than in the, in the low income groups. The same for FICO, right? It is um, even, so in level, it's different for poorer people. So you know, it's safe. if you take the lowest income group, the def the number of defaulting loans went from six percent to twelve percent. The number of or the fraction sorry of default right went from six to twelve. Which is what intuitively you would expect. But you would have expected, right? But for the rich group or the high FICO groups, it went from basically zero, zero point two to five percent. Right? So the rate of increase was astronomical for the prime people, right? But of course, the level <laughs> still sounds small because it's five compared to 12, right? But we have to, of course, think of the rate. Let me say one thing I always say, which is the pain inflicted on people, of course, was probably disproportionately in the low income groups, right? Because every person defaulting is a drama for the household. But for the financial system, that's what we're trying to say, is where the pain really came from was from the prime people. And the popular media, of course, and of perhaps course. rightfully so, focuses on the, uh, the burden to the individual and not to the economy. Right. Authors and, and Paul and the discussant too. And I think the papers all, the empirical work has documented this real big decline in mortgage originations and the tightening of standards and all that. If you look at the stock of debt, household debt, or the stock of household credit, to say GDP, it has come down since the crisis, but it is still at something like mid-2000 levels, which is still pretty high. And I guess it raises questions of, what is the sustainable amount of household credit? Are we kind of there yet? And maybe these higher rents and multifamily is, is what we'd expect. Is a, um, but I just wonder if there are any comments, um, having looked at, say, the distribution of, of the different borrowers on what is a sustainable level and are, are we actually there yet? One thing, I just remember that relative to GDP, yeah. it's gone down a lot. Still mid 2000 levels. No, but remember the, yeah. you're saying mid 2000 Relative levels of, of credit of, to GDP. Yeah. The credit, you know, oh. debt to GDP ratio has fallen, but it is, you know, still way above what it was in the mid 1990s. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that's at like 19, early 80s levels. I mean, that's right. way, way down. So I mean, interest rates have come down. But interest rates have changed. Well, yeah, although remember, not for the most, almost all of the loans are fixed rate, right? Yeah. So that's not. So I'm just going back to the payments. The, the flow is what matters for most so of this stuff. The, the flow, yeah. I have one other thing to say, because I just looked at the fact that I talked to some people there. It should make you worry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On top of what you're saying is, if you look at who is holding the debt now yeah. in the US, it's disproportionately older people. Yeah. So it, it, like, it's very different from pre crisis And of course, a lot of it has to do with, you know, kind of what some of you were saying, millennials have not been buying mortgages yet, mm -hmm. but old people were either holding or buying also after the crisis. Um, and they, some of them were the ones taking out the pre -fire. So we have now a lot of debt in the hands of quite old people. Right? Hopefully, because uh, you know, kind of, uh, life expectancy is also going up, they will be there to live to the end of their mortgage. But it's not. <laughs> so just on that point, yeah, I think, um, you know, I don't know if, the, if it's really reached the steady state yet because the level of mortgage debt is so steep. Not only are the loans very long term, but when things go bad and they did during the financial crisis, the incentive for many households facing tighter credit conditions and the loss of value in their home is not to prepay their loans, which makes things even slower. So, you know, they always are kind of slow to roll off, but now I think it's even slower to kind of roll off. So we may see things keep going. I mean, one thing you do see is that some households actually are speeding up the process. They're getting these 15 year mortgages at kind of an unprecedented rate, which is designed to really pay down the debt quicker. But for the rest of them, I think the deleveraging, if you choose not to prepay your loan and you keep with the original schedule, is very slow. I'm sorry, let's go. Yeah, um, a couple of questions. The, uh, on the bin analysis of the default rates, um, has there been any, maybe the papers do this, but you didn't present it, the, the low doc, no doc um, bins and the IO, the interest onlys and so forth. You know, my experience has been that the banks that made those loans had much higher default rates than any of the more conventional type loans. So I'm wondering if there's been any data on that to further uh, understand this. And the second question I had is on the these price to income ratios. Um, Obviously, when, when a loan is originated, we all know the price to income ratio, but we don't know what happens. Kind of, I'm not sure that we really track that. I, I, I'm not expecting the papers to cover this, but if you look at oil prices during this same period of time, and I'm kind of curious about the lag and the default rates on your paper, Antoinette. If you look at oil prices, they went from like 25 to 45 or 65, and then 65 to ultimately like 150. If you look at the impact on the, the, the ability to service the loan, right, it's price to income during that period of time, when oil prices go from 25 to 65, at the lower income level, an extra 10 or 20 dollars a week in the ability to service the loan has a, ma a much bigger effect. And I'm just wondering if that may explain some of your the lag in those default rates. I think that, but it was dollar weighted, so I can't understand. I think that the rate, the rate of default was quite interesting because it got that may be more tied to the ability to service the loan. So, let me actually address your first question, which was about the payment to income ratio over the life of the loan. So one of the things that in the mortgage industry was always well known is that hard as this is to believe, the payment income ratio has very little predictive power for default at origination. In fact, when, Fan when Freddie Mac was originally building the automated underwriting system, they used a model, and basically the model would approve someone with an 80% payment to income ratio because it just didn't, their default probabilities were, were just weren't much higher. And so they had to put a clutch in, which is they just capped it at something uh, arbitrary. In other words, they wouldn't let the model uh, do it. And the reason is, so we have this, actually use the PS idea, another paper, uh, and we follow people over time. And basically, if you look at the payment to income ratio at origination, the coefficient is something like a quarter if you look at the payment to income ratio at the time when the borrower is making the decision. So basically the problem is, and we kind of know this from the labor literature, the variance of income is enormous. And so basically who's defaulting is not the people who had low income when they got the mortgage, it's people who have low income at some, at some point subsequently. Because they lose their job. They lose their job. Yeah, I mean that's always been the big, or they get divorced or something like that. That's true. Um, so the 
I mean, to, to follow up on one side, it is true though that you can even see this in the data that between 2006 and 2008, what you you know, when a lot of these arms and um, you know, uh, you know, kind of deferred payment mortgages came on, is that the debt to income was much higher than the payment to income because it was a lot of it was bank loaded. Now, as Paul said, these people in some sense got very lucky that the crisis happened. I mean, I know this is a bad thing to say, but it's because of it, right? Interest rates dropped to zero, and those people had big windfalls. And actually, Paul has shown in a, in a paper of his that that really created, in a way, a lot of slack for those households in, you know, in being able to pay. Um, I like the idea of the oil prices, so I haven't looked at the oil price shock. The part is that actually we don't see exactly how people pay down. I, you know, I have really good data about debt for income and so on and origination. It's much tougher to see, you know, the speed at which people pay down. In particular, the, how the income changes over time. I would literally need IRS data, right, individual IRS data to see how people's income changes. I'm trying to get it, but you know, you, as you can imagine, that's very difficult. <coughs> you also asked us about low doc and so on. Um, it's definitely true that truck prime lenders and low doc loans had higher <coughs> default rates, but again, that actually went it also up a lot for middle income, middle class people. And what we even see is that a lot of middle class people took right these alt A loans, um, where I would argue a lot of it they had they had access to financial credit. I mean, to to uh, conforming loans. But it looks like they chose not to take them, probably for speed of convenience, for you know, kind of the fact that they got a bit more leverage this way. Um, but that's definitely something. That I think it could be true that the, that the lenders didn't want to take that in the portfolio, and it would be better off to just lay that risk off to the taxpayer because they knew that that was a. But if on this, just one other thing: the low doc is yeah. the point about low doc is most of the time it's because you had a high credit score. So this is perception that the low doc was. You know, given the people with 500 credit scores. It wasn't. Most of the low doc is going to be the guy from the New York Times that has 800 credit score. Uh, and, uh, and the point is, those are the people where you say, oh, the person has an 800 credit score, I don't need, these are people, they take care of their own underwriting in some sense. And, um, and so, actually, if you look at the distribution of growth accounted for by all day, it's mostly in the higher income areas. <laughs> One last question, Lori. I was going to actually make a related point to that, and that is that, DT, that um, when you look at, um, de at um, debt payments to income, you're sort of ignoring the rise of all these affordability products like the interest-only loans and the 40-year amortization loans, and those were huge, huge products. I mean, their interest-only loans were at 1.25% for Freddie, and Freddie's book of business, they were much, much larger than 14 years of the all-day book of business, they were probably something like 80% of the all-day book. So I mean, I really liked your point that people were, you know, leveraging up. They were, but you don't. But the debt to income ratios were flatter than they otherwise would have been because the payments were artificially lower. And that goes to Daniel's um, point, which on the um, I think a lot of the relaxation was act actually isn't showing up in debt to income numbers because of the because of the rise of the of the rise of these affordability. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Interest-only loans, arms, or uh, products that, you know, maybe you can overstate your income, uh, all these things would have relaxed things further. Absolutely. Okay, I'll just, just keep us on schedule. Sorry um, to those of you I didn't get to. Um, we reconvene at 1045. Thank you all very much.